you've probably studied this some, um, that King Herod the Great, King Herod the Great was a puppet king in, uh, in the land uh, that the Romans were, were occupying. He was a puppet king uh, to the Romans, and he was king over the region of Palestine and that area, uh, Judea, during the time of Jesus. Now, Herod was known throughout the world uh, for his great architecture. If you look in the history books, there's all kinds of references to Herod the Great being this great architect, and he had a style of classical architecture, uh, numerous wonderful, majestic building projects were done during Herod the Great's time, and that's why actually he got that title, is because he was a great designer and builder of buildings. And um, Herod the Great, uh, he undertook construction of the Jewish temple, which was the crown jewel of his projects between uh, 37 and 4 uh, BC. Now, Ezra's temple in Jerusalem, when uh, the Israelites were released from the Persian uh, Persian uh, captivity, I started with Babylon and moved to Persia, and Cyrus the Great ordered that the people should return, Ezra and Nehemiah, they, you know, they rebuilt Jerusalem and the temple, and uh, that uh, was built uh, on a magnificent scale, not like Solomon's temple, but Herod the Great came along, and in 19 uh, BC in particular, he started to really work on uh, refitting the temple and making it a very beautiful place. It was a magnificent retrofit of the second temple. And um, I guess the, 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 the main temple was finished in a year and a half, and, and, and history books tell us that all the way to the time where the temple was destroyed, they were continually working on it. So it was a beautiful building. And, um, you know, there was a lot going on to comply with the religious law Herod, he employed thousands of priests as masons and carpenters for this rebuilding. So, you know, we don't see that today, but if you can picture in your mind, like, the number of years and the resources that were poured in, this place was majestic. Like, there was gold everywhere, there was carvings in the rock, it was a beautiful temple. Then this starts off, this is the context for the start of our message today, in chapter 13, Reading from verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. So you could just see the disciples, they're like, Wow, look at all this beautiful architecture. It's all in honor of Jehovah God, right? Look, Jesus, don't you see this? The grandeur of this building. Um, you know, had a wow factor to it. And even today, when you visit the uh, the Temple Mount um, on the outside, I was there a couple of years back, and, and you see these giant stones that are they're heaped up in rubble off of the Temple Mount, former stones that belong to the, the Temple. And, uh, you know, it's different today, but you can still see, when you look at it, you can see the gates up in the wall, and you think, man, that must have been something else when it was before it was destroyed. And, uh, you know, so Jesus, they said, look, teacher, what massive stone, what magnificent buildings. So uh, Jesus says in reply in verse 2, he says, do you see all these great buildings? He says, replied Jesus. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Well, I mean, when he said that, I mean, they're looking at these huge stone structures, and they're probably wondering to themselves, how is, is that going to happen? But at this point, Jesus tells his, his disciples prophetically that the temple that they were standing in, and that he was teaching in the courts of, and, it, and, and, and the, the buildings, the infrastructure that they were admiring, <coughs> would actually be not just partially destroyed, but completely destroyed. In AD 70, this actually happened. Titus, the commander of the Roman legions, would enter Jerusalem to quell a rebellion against the Roman Empire. And at that time, the emperor uh, Vespasian, Vespasian sent his army into Jerusalem. 
and uh, Titus was his son, and, and Titus was looking for something to kind of raise his, uh, I guess, prestige amongst the Roman people. There was a lot of infighting at that time in the Roman Empire, and Vespasian became the emperor uh, after there was a lot of toggling going on as to who the next king was going to be, and he was looking for a way to, to you know, beef up his uh, uh, polls in, in the Roman Empire, and, and Titus was certainly looking to, to advance himself as well. So uh, we're told that um, the fall of Jerusalem took place, that, that the soldiers came in and they, and they, they laid siege to the place, and, and there was a great... Uh, chasing out of the Jews and, and, a, and, a, and a slaughter of the Jews. And, and according to history, apparently um, somebody carelessly set the temple on fire and all the gold that was in the temple ran down in between the stones that were, that were in the temple. And, and Titus, wanting to get the gold, ordered everything to be dismantled stone by stone so they could get the gold out of these stones. That's that we're told in the history books, but you know the the war against the Jews happened at a great time of political instability, and they needed this great victory. And of course, you know this this victory was won, and uh, the, the Jew Jewish rebellion and the Zealot rebellion and it, all, all that was taking place there was was quelled. It was squished, and um, to this day, to this day, when you go. Uh, to uh, Rome, in front of the old Colosseum, there is an arch. Now, in those days, they used to make these arches that would go into special places, like in this particular case, the Colosseum was built, and the archway that led into this Colosseum was this magnificent structure that was made by Titus. It's called the Arch of Art of Titus. And, and on that was uh, carvings of the triumph of Titus against the Jews. That was all part of this. And we know that the Colosseum was the place where the Christians were, were massacred and where they were brought into the Colosseum and fed to lions and, and gladiators. And, and, and the Roman Empire at this time used this as propaganda to, to, to show themselves as powerful. And, uh, you know, there's even a, a coin that was stamped um, on the time of the defeat of the Jews. It's still in collectors' uh, purses or in their collections, wherever they might be. Uh, there's still, there's a stamp of a, of a Jewish lady, you know, weeping. And uh, a strong, tall Roman male figure standing over her, looking like an overlord over her. And a palm tree in the background, and, and this, and, and it says on the coin, the defeat of the Jews. You know, it, it was just this huge thing. Now, even today, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's talk in the history books. There's actually two. There's actually two great um, arches that Titus made in honor of his campaign in Judea against the Jewish revolt there. And the second one was in front of what they called the Circus Maximus. And uh, that's, that was destroyed a long time ago in the 8th and 9th century. It was destroyed, but there's description in history books about what this, what, this, what this was and the depictions that were on it. And what was written on it in the history books, it says, subdued the race of the Jews and destroyed the city of Jerusalem by which all generals, kings, or races previous to himself had either been attacked in vain or not even attempted at all. That's actually what was written on this arch in front of the Circus Maximus. So here is Jesus telling his disciples what was to come. And they wouldn't have understood. Well, why would they tear the stones, you know, completely apart, stone from stone? That, that's why. So it happened. It happened. And, and as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, as we read in verse 3, continuing, um, Opposite to the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, said, tell us, when will all these things happen? What will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Interesting. Interesting passage. Romans 13, has, or sorry, 
Mark chapter 13 has sometimes been taken the wrong way. And I, I'm going to explain something here. Okay? That was the question they asked. Tell us when these things happen. Okay? When you when you hear that question, the answer to the question you think is, well, he's talking about just solely the destruction of the temple, with the temple stones being thrown down one from another, no stone left on top of the other. That's that's the question. Right? They're, they're asking, when will these things happen? And what are the signs? That they are all about to be fulfilled. So some people have taken wrong uh, Mark 13. I don't like that Romans 13. Right? <laughs> Mark 13, they take that and they go, that's solely what they were asking Jesus about. And so then everything in that chapter they, they peg to being answered in regards to the destruction of the Jewish temple in AD 70. Okay? But as always, when you read the Bible, if you're a student of the Bible, you have to be very careful when you interpret scripture. You need to ask yourselves, is this the only thing that speaks to this? Or are there other places in the Bible that speak to the same thing that can provide a proper context and maybe provide some more detail? As you all know, Mark is the shortest of the three uh, gospels that really dig into uh, you know, the the teachings of Christ and John is the fourth gospel and it talks a lot about soteriology with the salvation aspect of it. The first three are more, or, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are more historical in the way they approach it. There's a lot more um, soteriology or salvation teaching through the book of John. Now, just keep that in mind. <laughs> this is what they call the Olivet Discourse in Mark chapter 13 and, and you're like, well, why would you, why would they call it that? Well, it's because they, Jesus was teaching his disciples about this on the Mount of Olives. He was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so they called it the Olivet Discourse. So, the interesting thing about this passage in Mark chapter 13 is it's also addressed, this same exact scenario is addressed in the book of Matthew on a parallel gospel which from Matthew's perspective, okay? So in the parallel gospel, some of the detail is less than what Mark says, and some is greater just in different aspects of it. Like, you have these four gospels, four accounts, and sometimes they speak to the same things, and they provide a different angle to look at it, and when we look at it all together, we see the proper context. So Matthew 24, verse 4, actually reads this. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? It's the same question that Mark asked. But Mark ended there. Okay? Tell us when these things will happen. When will this happen? Tell us when this will happen, Matthew says. But then he continues. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So you see, when you look at the two together, when Jesus was giving the Olivet Discourse, he wasn't just talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. He was talking about the entire history to come between the time of his ascension, which he would be ascending into heaven, and his second coming. So... You miss that if you just read Mark and you and you keep the blinders on there and you go, oh, he's all everything happened before 70 AD. Jesus must have come back mysteriously a second time, sometime right after the temple was destroyed, because it falls in line with the timeline. Because they're asking the question to Mark here, well, when is this going to happen? And they're obviously they think they're referring to the destruction of the temple being thrown down. Stone by stone. Right? See. If you don't read the whole picture, you get it wrong. My friends, when we're stu students of Scripture, this is why it's important for us to be biblically uh, engaged and biblically literate. When, when I speak something from the pulpit, you should be digging in on your own to try and see what the Scripture says. Okay? There's going to be times where, where you're going you're gonna to do a study and you're going to see another angle that's going to provide proper context to what you're 
what you're reading. And it's that way about all kinds of different things. You don't just pull one little thing out of there and, and, and focus on that one little thing. Because you might, you might just get it wrong. And people have got this wrong. Lots of people have got this wrong. Okay, so Mark emphasizes specifically the names of the disciples. You see Mark names the, four, the disciples. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Matthew doesn't. Matthew doesn't focus on the, the names of the disciples. He just says the disciples. Okay? And then he gives specifics, not just about the destruction of the Roman temple in AD 70, which was horrific. It was a horrific time. But it also gives perspective on the sign of his coming and the sign of the end of the age as well. So there, there is a uniformity in the scriptures. So, firstly, Jesus tells his disciples the state of the world and what the state of the world is going to be in before he comes. And he says this to them in verse 5. Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Okay, if Jesus is saying this to his disciples, this is a very strong warning. Watch out that no one deceives you. These are believers in him. These are his primary disciples. And this is for all of us as well. If he's saying, watch out that no one deceives you, there must be deceiving spirits out there that can lead us astray. Otherwise, it wouldn't be such a strong warning. Watch out that nobody deceives you. Jesus warns. He warns that there is going to be a danger of false messiahs that will come in his name. They will pretend to be him, but in fact, they will be clever counterfeits. And this has happened. If you look at the history, and I'm speaking a lot about history this morning, if you look at history, there has been so, so many false messiahs claiming to be Jesus <coughs> come back a second time. And uh, since Jesus ascended, literally hundreds of different people have claimed to be the returned Christ Jesus only to be found out as shams. And right now, as we speak, there are many false Jesuses in the world. And i just like to share pictures of four of them with you. So, you see this on the video. Or on the, yeah, this, is, uh, this is the first false Jesus that I'm going to talk about. Okay, this is uh, Enrique Cristo of Brasilia, Brazil. Now, in, in here he calls himself Jesus. He calls himself the returned Messiah. And he calls Brasilia, Brazil, the New Jerusalem. And believe it or not, there is quite a number of people that actually follow him. And, uh, you know, they live a quiet life, kind of like hippies, in the, in the kind of background and they grow their own food, they're kind of preppers, you know, they're, they're uh, focusing in on uh, Inuri's teachings and readying themselves for what's, what he says is coming next, and they're just kind of waiting with bated breath on every word that he says. False Jesus, false Messiah. The second one, um, there is a guy in Africa named Moses Halangwe. Okay, Moses Halangwe. You see him there at his wedding, he's carrying a knife. Wouldn't you like to be the bride there? <laughs> On his hat is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus. He calls himself Jesus. They call him King of Kings. These people, lots of, of people. And uh, he claimed his wedding day um, was the start of the end of days. And, and the, the, the lady that he married was one of his disciples who claimed was actually an angel. Believe it or not, I, I heard something like this. When I was a young pastor, no, that was a long time ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that was like okay, so when I was a young pastor, um, I had a congregation and I had this person, very well-meaning, very sincere, but misled. They came up to me and said, Pastor, do you think, uh, I've got these people that are visiting my place right now, and, and he's a prophet, and she's an angel. And they go around ministering, and, and they'd like to 
have the opportunity to minister in our church. Did anyone hear the no? <laughs> no. This is not right. Deceiving spirit. This person was well-meaning, young in Christ, well-meaning, but open book, you know, like, oh, I, I want to get everything that God has for me, but yet not discerning. Deceiving spirit bought in with it. And I had to explain to her why this was not a good idea and the, how this person couldn't be an angel and how this person couldn't be a prophet. Had some teaching to do. She did it. Accepted, but reluctantly. They are very convincing people. Okay, next. There is David Shaler. There's a, a British one. A British Jesus. David Shaler of England. And uh, David, you see here? There's two pictures of him. He delivered his Sermon on the Mount in 2008. And um, he has this opinion that uh, the spirit of his deity, being Jesus, compels him to approach his congregation as a cross-dresser sometimes. Why? Because he believes that his partial identity as a woman gives practical insight into the world from a female perspective. And because of this, he has a tremendous following in Great Britain. Now, false Jesus. False Jesus. And the last one I just, there's lots of others, but these are just kind of four prominent ones. Um, there's Vissarion of Siberia, and this one is absolutely crazy. You look at this, right? Okay. This guy, seriously, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he was a, he was a traffic cop. Believe it or not, he was a traffic cop. And he received the, revolution at the a revelation in himself at the fall of the Soviet Union that he was Jesus Christ who would come back a second time. That's, that's what he... You know, right now, right now as we speak, approximately 10,000 people live in the Siberian forest with him and believe that he is Jesus Christ who has come back a second time. Wow. 10,000 people. Pretty. Like if you look at a close-up of his face, they don't have a close-up here. But he looks like you'd see a picture of Jesus, you know, painted by... Uh, some artist somewhere, right? I mean, sometimes people paint pictures because it, it draws them to think about Jesus. Yeah, we don't worship icons, but sometimes people feel like it, it turns their mind to Jesus. But this guy looks like it. So, in Mark 13, 6, Jesus warns about these kind of people. He says, Many will come in my name, claim, I am he. And will deceive many. To deceive 10,000 people? That's quite a deception. Now, we know about the Jonestown Massacre and all that. People can sometimes take the discernment and throw it out the window because something appeals to their emotions. How do we know if someone is saying that they are from God or not? How do we know how we feel? by the charisma of their personality and how they rattle us you know, to the core and make us feel warm and fuzzy, make us feel, oh, you know? No! That is the wrong approach. By God's word alone can we tell what comes from God or not from God. If we turn our back on the word of God and follow our emotions solely, we'll be led astray. I'm not saying we have to be a bunch of Vulcan Christians. Like, I feel no emotion. Right? No! God made you with emotion. You don't have to be a Vulcan Christian. You can be a Christian that experiences emotions, but your emotions need to follow the cart. You know, in, in, your emotions need to follow the cart that is driven by Jesus. Right? You, you, if you let your emotions go, they'll lead you all over the place, and you'll go into all kinds of false teaching. And you, you end up in terrible places. God's word alone is the foundation. Jesus continues telling his disciples in verse 7 and 8, When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. See? Sometimes, when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, when we see wars happening, 
we go, wow, I wish that didn't have to happen. And guess what? What does the Bible say is here? Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Why? Because man is in his heart without God is far from him and is ruled by sin. And to show sin for the evil and the wrong that it is, God allows this to play out. And he allows people with the choice to come to him and to surrender their lives to him or to, to make themselves God, which is essentially the root of all kinds of evil, right? Money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, the root of money is self-worship, really. That's what Satan wanted. That's why he says, did God really say it? You know, don't you want to be like God? Knowing good for me? Don't you want to have the control in your life over everything? That's the root. Pride. Selfishness. So such things must happen. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. Now, we're talking from the time of the ascension of Christ right to the time of his second coming. Okay? So sometimes people go, okay, well, you know, they get confused over this. There's lots of earthquakes happening. There's lots of earthquakes happening. It must be right near the end. Well, yeah, that's that's true. But it's there's been earthquakes from the time of Christ all the way through history till now. And some people get confused about this and they go, well, hmm. There was earthquakes in the 15th century, 14th century, 13th century, all the way back to Jesus. So what, what is this all about here? What are, what are we talking about? Well, the key to this is found in the last part of verse 8. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now, as a man, I don't even claim to know what it's like to give birth to a baby. I mean, that's crazy, right? And my wife would say, yeah, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> no matter how hard it is, you know, you have not experienced that kind of pain. I, I believe. <laughs> I believe. I was there. <laughs> I was there when she grabbed my hand and nearly tore my thumb off. <laughs> I cut the thumb off years later. And she grabbed my hand and she was like, oh, and I'm like, oh, this woman is strong. <laughs> right? You probably did something similar with your wife if you're a father. And uh, yeah, there's the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus reminds us that before he returns, there will be many wars, threats of wars on the earth. Look at all the wars that we've had. And troubled times. Many people seem to think that the end is near, right? right? Napoleon, during the time of Napoleon, people were convinced that it was the end. There, every single terrible war that's been in history, people look at it and they go, oh, this must be it. Well, if you're a lady and you're going through labor, our first child, I don't know how long it was, hours, 12 hours or something crazy like that. It was a long time that she was in labor. And all of a sudden, you know, the pain would come. Ah, oh, would, and, and then, oh, we back on again, back on for a little while. And then, Again, it would come again. And it come in intervals, intervals, and get more intense, and the intervals get, it, it becomes more and more intense, right? Well, that's kind of like this. The wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and calamities and all that, they're always there from the time of Christ's ascension until today. But the intensity of it and the frequency of it is getting more and more and more. Look at the last you know, 100 years at, at all the terrible wars that we've seen in the world, right? Like the population is greater, the conflicts are on a larger scale, even stuff that we don't hear about out there is taking place as we speak. We know what's going on in the Ukraine. We know what's going on possibly in Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> like millions of people involved in these conflicts so this is, you know, the beginning of sorrows, just as a woman who is giving birth to a child starts into her labor and it gets, as it gets further along and the baby gets ready to be born, it gets worse and worse and worse. But the fact that we have catastrophes does not necessarily signal that we're at the end because 
If you're a woman here, you might have thought, man, can it get any worse? It must be coming now. Oh, you're only three centimeters. <laughs> what? <laughs> ah! What's this? Still more to come, right? <laughs> so, there will be wars, rumors of wars, labor pains that will come and go more frequent, more intense, leading to the final push. The final push is coming. Jesus next describes what his disciples must expect during the time between his ascension and the second coming, saying in verse 9, starting in verse 9, you must be on your guard. Be on your guard. Okay, that's another warning, just kind of similar to the warning we just read about, right? But be on your guard. Well, what are you going to say, Jesus? You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. See, from the time of Nero, shortly after Jesus ascended, when the disciples were still alive, some of them were still alive, right then. Okay. In the time of Nero, right into the modern day, there has been persecution of true believers in various places of the world. And like those birth pains, there's been waves of pain and suffering that have happened. We've seen that in the first century with Nero, and we've seen it all the way through the centuries, even to today. You know, I was doing some statistical study, did a lot of that in this preparation for this message, but I did some statistical study on this, and in the past hundred years, there's been more people put to death for taking a stand as a follower of Jesus Christ than for all the centuries before that combined. Did you know that? For example, in uh, 2004, between 2004 and 2010, this is a little dated, but the nation of Sudan has been one of the greatest persecutors of Christians in the history of the world. And um, there's been an estimated of 1.3 million Christians and other non-Muslim people executed just in that time frame between 2004 and 2010. 1.3 million. Can you imagine in Canada if the entire city of Calgary was executed in that short of time? Can you imagine? That's what we're talking about here. This is happening on the other side of the world in different places. For all true believers and followers of Christ, our commander-in-chief tells us, he tells us, be on your guard. Be on your guard. And this means that we should not be surprised when things do not go smooth sailing and well for us in this world. We shouldn't be surprised. Sometimes we get trials on our plate. We go, this is terrible. Well, in proportion to what's going on in other places, hey, it's not that bad. When things don't go well for us, we, didn't, we should be shocked. We should not be surprised. Be on your guard. This means that when things come, we should be ready. You should be prepared. I should be prepared to face persecution for the gospel that I stand and believe in. And then I ask the question, do I really believe that what I believe is really real? Because if I don't, and the persecution hammer drops, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> Gone. My religion of... of Comfort and curiosity is out the window, people. Be on your guard. John 15, 18. Remember what Jesus said in that? He says, he reminds his disciples, he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Hated me first. Jesus says that before the time of his coming, the gospel will have to be preached to all nations. Now, this is another sign. Now, one may ask, well, hasn't this been accomplished already? Uh, if you look from the perspective of actual national boundaries, yep, it has. Actually, 
the gospel has gone into every single country of the world right now. However, we have to be careful again when we're interpreting the scriptures to go back to the to the intentional meaning of it. And in this particular passage, the word for eight nations is not national boundaries, it's ethnos, meaning people group of the same ethnicity. And in this case, with ethnos, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of people to be reached with the gospel. And that's why our church and other churches support Bible translators so that we can um, give the people the gospel message in their own tongue so they can read it and they can they can hear the message of God through their own tongue, through through reading their own language. And in the world there's 3,496 languages that, that are identified. And out of those languages, 3,496, there's still 1,892 languages which represents 145 million people out of 7 billion that have no scripture translation in their hand that they are native to. Now some of those will understand English or whatever, maybe French, some of them, maybe some other language, Chinese, some are bilingual and they'll be able to read God's word or hear God's word, but that's the stats. 1,892 languages, 145 million people still haven't got scriptures in their language in their hands. So it's important for us to support Bible translators like Wycliffe. We got a missionary couple that we, the RMVs that we support through Wycliffe. Awesome. We like to do that. We want to do more of that. During the time, see, when the gospel is going forward, the scriptures, they tell us people, you, can't, you might get into bad terms with your government, you might get arrested. You might get put on trial for your belief in Jesus. Yeah. You know what, people? That might happen. We might elect as a nation because of the, the nature of people's hearts right now and their distance from God. We might elect a very worse government than we have right now. You think it's bad right now? It can get a whole lot worse. And it might. Does it mean that, uh, you know, should we allow this to keep us up at night? No. No. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your understanding. Look to Jesus as your strength and sufficiency, and he will carry you through whatever comes. Be on guard. The world will hate us. You know, you're going to preach the message out there to certain people that are going to despise you and hate you and cancel you. They're going to do the cancel culture thing on you because you are Christ's disciple. And the Bible tells us that we ought to love our enemies and pray for the ones that despitefully use us, right? That treat us wrong. It's tempting just to go, yeah, well, yeah, well, take that, you know? That's not part of the Beatitudes. We need to be reminded of that. It's not take that. It's like, oh, what did Jesus do? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you. Pray for them. Pray that God would have mercy on their souls. Corey Tambu lost her sister in the concentration camp. One of the guards in the Nazi prison camp that was responsible for the death of her sister came and asked her for forgiveness. Was that easy for Corey Tambu? You read the story? Absolutely not. That was not easy. This is where we don't trust our emotions, people. We don't have faith based upon how we feel. We trust the Lord and do good according to what he says. Why? Because we love him. And he says, love your enemies. So she forgave him. She chose to forgive him. You might say, I've been hurt so bad that I can't forgive. Well, you know what? If you can't forgive, you need to go to prayer and ask God to have mercy on you. Because if you can't forgive people that hurt you, you will never be 
a God honoring disciple, you never will. Because the root of that will take you into terrible places. And God loves us. He doesn't want us to go down that path. He really doesn't. Yeah, now I've been hurt. You've been hurt. Who here's been hurt? All of us, right? We've all been hurt. Some of us have talked about this this morning. How hurt we've been. Bless those who curse you. So, 12. This is a heavy scriptural passage. Heavy stuff, eh? Heavy. But good. good. Verse 12. Brothers will betray brother to death. And a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Wow. That's the ultimate betrayal. Can you imagine? Can you imagine your head being on the chopping block because your dad turned you in and said he's a Christian? Get rid of them. Can you imagine how that would be? Or, you know, you're a father and you're trying to teach your child right from wrong and, and they take they take the opportunity to uh, have you thrown in jail for whatever reason. Can you imagine that? It's terrible. Jesus says, be on guard. Be ready. That's that's what that's coming. But the next week we're going to talk about what's coming, and we need to be prepared. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. <laughs> so what's it like out there in Canada? Yeah, we've had a few attacks on our Christian virtues and our religious liberties over the course of the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. But what's happening out there in the rest of the world? You know, if I am an Orthodox Jew in Israel right now, and I decide to become a follower of Jesus, guess what? They're going to consider me a blasphemer. I'm going to get cut off from my family. Remember, uh, Dean Cheriker, the Jewish uh, missionary that came to see us, Jews for Jesus, he paid a terrible price to become a follower of Jesus. His family rejected him. And he's praying for him, but what a pain. That's, that's such pain. If I'm from a Muslim family in Iran, I might be rejected by my family and, and literally beheaded for choosing Jesus, for converting to another religion. If I was from a Hindu family in India and they were staunch Hindus, I'd be rejected for training my back on Hinduism. And there's a very real possibility I'd be martyred too, too in, in India. In China, yep, they allow you to practice Christianity as long as you're part of the state-sponsored church. And if you're not, and if you don't toe the line of the communist agenda, you're persecuted. Thousands of pastors have paid the price with their lives. Millions of believers have been persecuted and are continuing to be persecuted. There is a new wave of persecution in China. There was a bit of an ease in the bird pounds. There was a new wave of persecution in China. You know, since 2000, it started to ramp up again. And now it's, it's really a difficult thing to be a Bible-believing, genuine Christian in China right now. Sudan, well, that's to be said. You become a Christian, you're dead. They find out, they find you, you're dead. Literally, that's it. Indonesia, same thing. Islam conversion or death? You, know, you convert from Islam to Christianity, that's it. It's a death sentence to you. Now, right now, right now, And I say this because we need to pray for these people. Right now, in North Korea, 
there are between 50 and 70,000 Christians in concentration camps being held right now. Put that into perspective, people. We need to be praying. And we need to be on guard. The real persecution cause for these people is because of me. That's what Jesus said. Because you believe. Because of me. The kind of opposition that I'm talking about is going to increase. It's going to increase here. You know, there's a prosperity gospel that's out there preaching that uh, that the whole world is going to get converted before the coming of Jesus and they're going to usher in Jesus. They have this interpretation. Uh, that's not what the scripture says. Scripture doesn't say it's going to get nice and peachy and easy. That you're, you're going to build this Christian empire across the globe that's going to eradicate evil. No. The Bible says there is going to be a birth. And the birth is going to be painful. And when the birth happens, there's going to be joy because the kingdom of our Lord, is, or the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Because our commander in chief is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not like Lord of Lords, not like these shams. When our King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes, he's going to put an end to all the stuff that's going on. He shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow in prayer with me?